So hello everybody, welcome back to the Extract Wine series. Uh, today's talk will be 100% phenomenal because we have Chris Cummins uh, from the House of Katzos, a descendant of the House of Brihini. And Ira will do the introduction. Oh, okay. Well, it's nice to be back. I, I found myself really excited about tonight because it's been so long. Uh, and I, you know, if I um, uh, seem excited, it's because I am. And I'm really happy that Chris is uh, the one who's going to be speaking to us today. Um, there are a couple of announcements uh, we want to make. One, one is that uh, the web page for the upcoming conference next year is up. And right now it's very rudimentary, but uh, you can see on attached to my name underneath it are, um, is the actual website. Uh, so if you want to just write it down or go to the Facebook page or whatever, you could find it. But I just thought this would be an easy way to um, uh, spread the news. Uh, and that's where you'll find eventually everything about where to submit, which will be that page actually, uh, you know, uh, dates. I've started looking for restaurants. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really, I'm really in, uh, into it. Um, and that's going to be September uh, next year. And um, and uh, speaking of conferences and the expert conference in particular, we have also some other news which Napoleon's going to share with us. So take it away, Napoleon. All right. Thank you very much, Ira. Um, so time passes, some say time flies, and it's been some time since the um, expert conferences have been going on. Um, in fact, a few people here will remember that they started quite um, informally back in, it was 1999, Ira, when, when you had the first meeting in Lyon, or was it 97? No, that was, was 2001. 2001. Yeah, 1998, there was a... a... British conference where there was a session on experimental pragmatics. Uh, oh. That was in the eight, and that was in Luton, I think. You see, I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, and then Teresa Quasti had a conference in Milan, and then mm -hmm. by two thousand and five, um, there was sufficient awareness in the field that something's going on and something's got traction. Um, that there was a conference in Cambridge. Some of you might remember it organized by um, Richard Brihini, uh, a very sort of up and coming lecturer called Richard Brihini, um, and one of his first PhD students called Napoleon Katsos. And um, that was 20 years ago. No, that was how many years ago? 17. That was, uh, it was 2005. 17. Can't do it now. Chris can do it and make an argument out of the number. Um, but I've been really honored to receive an email from Ira and Chris um and no Ira and Richard and maybe a few more people and think would Cambridge host the 2025 expra conference so that's some time from now uh, I haven't booked the restaurant yet <laughs> but I am very excited about it so um I'll be delighted to be preparing for it and really it's an honor and thank you for uh, uh, Ira and Richard for suggesting that we could have it in Cambridge so after Paris hopefully Cambridge. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, without further ado, um, let me um, introduce Chris very briefly because we're short on time. But Chris says, I mean, he's been one of the mainstays of experimental pragmatics from the start, partly because he was a student of uh, Napoleon's and and uh, grandson of Richard's. Uh, and he's already, you know, written like four different books or edited. I mean, one that, that I'm more aware of than the others is the Handbook of Experimental Semantics and Pragmatics from Oxford. Um, and of course, he's written many articles. And he's become kind of our specialist on, um, on expressions of quantity. And today he's going to talk about, well, the title is Lies, Damned Lies, and Argumentative Expressions of Quantity. So the floor is yours, Chris. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you for that very kind uh, introduction in the first place. Sorry, bear with me. I'm just going to try and sort out screen sharing. There we go. And um, well, it's a great pleasure to be here in the you know what I feel is my 
Boom Research Community and uh, to have the opportunity to speak to you. I'm a little bit concerned about the hype one way or another. Um, as I mean, the talk was described in advance as exciting, which I thought, I'm sure you've booked the right person. And also it made me feel a little bit like one of those winter wonderland attractions that you get at this time of year, which ends up being a tremendous disappointment with like, you know, one depressed reindeer and a drunk guy and no snow. So it might be a bit like that. Um, but as it's so close to Christmas, I thought, well, let's you know, push the boat out and be festive. And then I realized I've written a talk, which is, you know, to a large extent about um, politics and economics and coronavirus and death. So, but after that's over, we can, we can drink. Um, so yeah, uh, I've got back to thinking about quantity expressions again. And I think the reason I think about quantity expressions and particularly number expressions so much uh, is because they're all around us. And I think I'm particularly kind of consuming a lot of news around COVID over the last couple of years. I was very conscious of that. Uh, not only that they're all around us and that they're doing so much work, but they're so widely misused um, and they're so often used to mislead. And often that that's in a way that's actually quite difficult to pin down. So even if you're interested in fact checking things, it turns out that your know, fact checkers are very good on matters of semantics, but not quite so good on matters of pragmatics, or at least not the kind of pragmatics that we're, we're sort of getting into in this space. I was looking for an example of, uh, of the kinds of thing I'm, I'm thinking about. And actually the one that uh, came to mind or came to eye when I was starting to write this talk was a piece in The Guardian, an opinion piece by William Keegan under the title of Brexit has made Britain the sick man of Europe again, where he made a statement that I thought I kind of did a bit of a double take on and thought, well, this is, I don't think he means what that sounds like he means. What he said was the Office for Budget Responsibility calculates the cumulative damage of Brexit will be enough to knock 4% every year off our potential GDP. Um, and I kind of thought, well, when you say cumulative and not 4% every year off, I think you get a reading of that, that it's supposed to be a cumulative process of this, this gap, this problem is growing by 4% a year. But of course, that's not really the case here. We're talking about a long run average. So the original forecast that he's talking about uh, talks about long run productivity falling 4% as a result of Brexit compared to where it would otherwise be. So it's bad, but it's not incrementally bad and getting worse in quite the way that that sounds like he means. So it kind of call that a, you know, a fairly benign example and one where I think there isn't an intent to mislead, but there is perhaps a slightly misleading inference arising from that because of the choice of words, because of what is being expressed. At the other end of the scale, um, you have examples that are grossly misleading. Um, I pick on one from The Independent, which is a secondhand report of um, something said by um, US celebrity doctor and subsequently failed Republican Senate candidate, Dr. Oz, which was described under the headline, Dr. Claims 9.8 million people dying could be worthwhile payoff if schools are reopened. You think 9.8 million people? Um, who would be so stupid as to say such a thing? And the answer turns out to be, well, literally nobody. Uh, because if you delve into what's what's been said, you know, Dr. Oz is talking about the idea that the opening of schools would cost two to 3% in terms of total mortality. Um, and they've calculated that if he's talking about all school children in America, that would be 1.7 million deaths. And if he's talking about all people in America, that would be around 9.9 .9 million deaths, according to the text. Um, so you've got these expressions, um, and you've got bureau spelled wrong at the end. But it turns out there's a considerable leap of logic here, or there's a leap of interpretation. The two, per, two to three percent increase in deaths, certainly that's being talked about by the Lancet article, and probably that's being talked about by Dr. Oz, is two to three percent on a baseline of the number of people who are expected to die anyway. Not that you'd suddenly get two to three percent total mortality figures as a result of that. Um, and this is obviously quite a significant difference, because at the time this was written, it was expected that the number of coronavirus deaths in the US might be the order of 100,000. So two to three percent of which was you know, talking about two or three thousand deaths, not 9.8 million deaths. Uh, I mean, I was quite surprised that this was written in the first place. I was quite surprised that it stayed up. I was surprised looking for it for this talk that it's still up there on the website and that the independent is still regarded as a reliable source for non-specialist information on Wikipedia. Um, but, you know, there you go. 
so I take it that's at the so they fair sorry, kind of at the far end of the scale of misleading. There's a serious problem with the with the facts here. Um, whatever is whatever the speaker or the writer is setting out to convey, that doesn't really comport with reality. But between these two very benign and very you know, malign cases, you've got a whole raft of expressions that are maybe a little bit misleading, but it's quite difficult to pin them down, as I said. So here I pick on an example from Keir Starmer, Sir Keir Starmer, the leader of the opposition Labour Party in the UK. Um, in connection with marks made about the policy of the then Prime Minister Liz Truss, who I've put in parentheses because that feels kind of historically appropriate. Um, and he said, as a direct consequence of the government's policy, mortgages are going up and not by a little, hundreds of pounds, 500 pounds is the average per month. So there's a slight ambiguity in here because mortgages, that seems to be an indefinite expression, but you've got a very specific amount of money, but it's being described as an average. This was refined by the Labour Party in a subsequent press release to the paraphrase, some mortgages are going up by an average of £500 per month. And this is an example that kind of rings bells with me because obviously what we've got here is a case of embedded quantification. So I'm going to come back to this example. What I want to talk about um, over the next few minutes is embedded quantification in general um, and some thoughts about the usage and interpretation of that and how we model it. And then trying to situate that within a more general account of language use that looks at the argumentative dimension and what that can tell us about quantifiers and numbers and how they work. And very briefly, I want to say something at the end about political argumentation from the, the kinds of kind of semantic pragmatic perspective that I end up thinking about it in um, as a consequence of doing this other work. But that's, as I said, rather uh, tentative and conjectural. So let's start with the familiar embedded quantification, obviously, a big deal for theories of scalar implicature and hence for you know, a lot of people here. Um, and particularly because it informs the, the default versus contextual debate in an unusual way, it informs it because there's actually a difference in predicted ultimate interpretations rather than just differences in processing. So that makes it kind of special. Um, so to oversimplify matters somewhat, we've got a whole raft of examples that have been talked about. Some have been investigated experimentally. And some of them uh, seem to support a defaultist account, whereas others appear to give succor to a contextualist account. So the kind of example that's you know, traditionally seen as maybe awkward for a Gricean style or post-Gricean contextualist account um, would be things like, most of the students heard some of the Verdi operas, an example I cribbed from Hertz and Puskulus 2009. Uh, on the basis, this is sometimes taken to implicate most of the students heard some, but not all of the Verdi operas. And as you will, many of you will doubtless already know and can explain better than I can, uh, that turns out not to be predicted to be available under a Gricean account, essentially because it involves something more than just the negation of the stronger utterable alternative. Um, in particular, I mean, you would, if you were talking about a situation, this is kind of a counterexample, a situation where a third of the students had heard none of the operas, a third of the students had heard all of the operas, and a third of the students had heard some but not all of the operas. Well, in this situation, you could say most of the students heard some of the Verdi operas. That would be semantically true because it's true of the some and the all uh, subsets, so two thirds in all. It would be false to say most of the students heard all of the Verdi operas. So you are in a situation where it ought to be not only semantically true, but also pragmatically felicitous to say most of the students heard some of the Verdi operas. I'm sorry about the background noise here, by the way, I have to stop. But even though the, we are in a situation where we can say most of the students had some of the Verdi operas felicitously, most of the students had some but not all of the Verdi operas is false. Only a third of them heard some but not all of the Verdi operas. So on a Gricean account, we don't expect most some to implicate most uh, some but not all. So that would suggest that um, there's room here for a, a defaultist explanation, or at least an explanation that and gives rise to these implicatures or upper, upper bound construals in situ. But at the same time, we've got um, examples like you must hear some of the Verdi operas. And per Hertz and Puskulus, this is very seldom taken to implicate you must hear some, but not all of them. That is, you're not allowed to hear all of them. And if we do get um, these enrichments of some to some, but not all taking place 
because of, for example, its exhaustivity operators being inserted systematically and freely in embedded positions, um, to borrow General Kierkegaard's phrase. It's quite difficult to explain why we don't get this reading or we don't seem to be able to access it. You know, it would be perfectly coherent meaning. I can perfectly well say this if I think that Traviata is going to change your life, but Nabucco is going to bring you out in a rash. I can say you must hear some of the Verdi operas, meaning you must hear some and you're not allowed to hear all, but that doesn't seem to work. So we're kind of between the two cases. And what we'd like to be able to do is to um, either extend the scope of the um, Gricean style account to, to explain some embedded cases or figure out how to constrain the insertion of exhaustivity operators uh, so the uh, implicatures don't arise or are not predicted to arise in situations where they're not welcome. Now, for what it's worth, I favor the, um, the Gricean account, um, but not to you know, insist upon the point, just to observe that there are ways in which you could get things that look like these embedded enrichments by assuming additional premises. Uh, and in the case of this particular example, if you know Verdi's operas, which I don't, or at least I didn't until I started researching this example, uh, he wrote a lot of operas, uh, some of which are very famous, like Cariata and Aida, uh, some of which are sort of moderately famous, like Simon Bocanegra, and some of which I've never heard of prior to this Lombardia la prima crociata, pardon my accent. Um, so you could say of these, well, you know, it seems to be a fact that some of these are in whatever the opera house equivalent of heavy rotation is. So Traviata is the second most widely performed opera of all time, according to the source, really left those there at 10. Um, and others are very seldom performed. So in practice, it's very easy to hear some of Verdi's operas, but it's very difficult to hear all of them. So that, if we took that to be a lemma, that might help us explain where these additional readings are coming from. We might get there in several different ways. We might get there by saying, well, look, you know, all things being equal, the probability that you would actually have heard all of Verdi's operas, given that you had heard some of them, is very small. You know, maybe it's so small that we think even for a large population of students, there's a very real chance that none of them who have heard some of the operas will have heard all of them. So that's one possibility. Maybe that's not very satisfactory. A second possibility, a little bit different, is to appeal to something like a homogeneity inference. I'm saying, well, we've got an implicature available to us that they didn't all hear all the operas, or they didn't, well, most of them. It's not the case that most of them heard all of the operas. So we have the existence of some students who didn't hear all of the operas. Maybe it's rather typical, given that one student didn't hear all the operas, to assume that the other students didn't as well. Maybe they're going to the same performances, maybe they're listening to the same recordings as part of their you know, identity as a student group. So maybe if one of them has heard some but not all, or even, even some but not most of the operas, then that's going to be also true of the others. A third possibility is that we're negating some other alternative. Um, and maybe the alternative we're negating is some of the students heard all of the Verdi operas. So instead of thinking about the stronger alternative, most of the students heard all of the Verdi operas, we can think instead of the stronger alternative, um, some of the students heard all of the Verdi operas. Now, obviously the question that leaps to mind is, if we are interested in that explanation, can we really say this alternative is stronger? And what do we mean by that compared to most of the students heard some of the Verdi operas? Um, and the answer is, well, obviously, it's not stronger in the sense of entailment. There's no entailment relationship between those two uh, possible sentences. But on the other hand, it might nevertheless be stronger if we were going to try and argue towards a plausible conclusion, given this utterance, like, you know, these students are especially dedicated scholars of opera. You know, speaking for myself, I don't think I know anyone who's heard all of Verdi's operas. So if you wanted to convince me that these students are particularly dedicated, telling me that some of them had heard all of those operas might be a better argument than telling me that, that lots of them have heard some of the Verdi operas, you know, big deal, so have many people. So it could be at a push that maybe the Hertz and Tusculus participants who endorse this pragmatic inference that, you know, most, some implicated, most, not all, uh, sorry, implicated, most, some, but not all, um, are inferring that kind of context. They're assuming that we're actually in a context where if some of the students had all of the Verdi operas, a cooperative speaker might say so. 
And I think in support of that, I would remark that we don't always care ever so much about entailment when we talk about stronger scale alternatives. We've got this family of examples like cheap versus free or rare versus extinct, or you know maybe even numerals if you want to talk about two versus three in the kind of uh, in the context of horn scales, where it's not really all that obvious that uh, the stronger term entails the weaker term. You know, to, to believe that we'd have to be willing to endorse the truth of things like dinosaurs are rare nowadays, or air is cheap to breathe. Even if we don't, we could say, well, yeah, but okay, it doesn't entail, but nevertheless, it is stronger to say free than to say cheap, and it's stronger to say extinct than to say rare. And that gives us basically what we need. So I'd be saying essentially entailment is a, is a special case. Entailment is a sufficient but not necessary condition uh, to have a stronger alternative in play. So I think this, this case is worth thinking about because, you know, in some sense, non-entailment between the alternatives is a fairly typical case. When you've got a speaker summarizing quite a complex data set, that speaker is often forced to choose among alternatives which don't stand in any entailment relation to one another. Um, so for example, if I have to decide whether I'm going to say something strong about a subset of individuals or something relatively weak about all of them, then I'm making that exactly that choice. I'm choosing between non-entailing alternatives, as in the Keir Starmer example. So Keir says some mortgages are going up by an average of £500 per month. And you immediately think, well, why talk about some mortgages? You know, it would be obviously much stronger to say most mortgages are going up by an average of £500 per month. But as far as one can gather, that wouldn't be true. So that's going to be, you know, ruled out as an option. You could say most mortgages are going up. Um, and that would be true, but that doesn't quantify the impact. It's hard to you know, use that to make the hearer care about this occurrence. You could, for that matter, say some mortgages are going up by an average of £1,000 a month, which would be true if you're talking about a smaller and different subset of mortgages. So I'll come back to that question. So in essence, there's a trade-off here between you know, what are you going to talk about in this brief summary, uh, and how much can you then say about it? in terms of establishing which is going to be the argumentative and most effective thing to do. So which is most effective? Well, I think in general, that's a very, very difficult question because really we're asking, well, effective at what? We're not really just talking about communicating information. And even if we were just talking about a purely information theoretic view, it depends what is already known, what it what can be assumed to be known. But I think it's worth delving into. And uh, to delve into it, I would look at this Sort of toy example that uh, Fausto Calcassi, who I think has been um, working on it, some work with uh, Michael Franca and me. So, in a, this toy example, we present uh, exam results for a bunch of students. They get questions, you know, right or wrong, out of a set of questions. I think there are 12 questions in play, maybe five students in this display. And participants are given the following instruction Imagine you have been hired as a marketing consultant for Green Valley High School. The results Exam questions have been published for Green Valley and for your main rival, Riverside. It's important you don't tell any lies, but you don't have to report objectively on the facts. Your aim is to make Green Valley sound like a school whose students have a high probability of success, and Riverside sound like a school whose students have a low probability of success. So we give naive participants these instructions, we give them stimuli like this, and we invite them to fill in the missing quantifiers uh, or predicates in a sentence like the one schematized at the bottom. In this exam, quantifier of the students got quantifier of the questions right or wrong. So here we've got a situation where you've got two students who got them all right, one student who got most of them right, two students who got some right. And the question is, you know, the challenge is describe the results of Green Valley so as to make it appear as there is a high success rate without lying. And here's one of the things you could say in this exam, some of the students got most of the questions right. Um, and of course, there are a bunch of other things you could say about this too. You could say some of the students got all of the questions right. You could say some of the students got most of the questions wrong. You could say most of the students got some of the questions wrong. There were these various options in play. Um, Now, there are various ways in which you could try and get at the question of what is effective. A naive one, just to illustrate the idea, would be to say, out of these options, what, are, what is the range of possibilities uh, that is left in play? 
out of, let's say, the total number of questions that were correctly answered among all the students depicted? Well, most of the students got most of the questions right, but let's assume that three out of five students is enough to call it most, and seven out of 12 questions is enough to call it most. Well, that gives us a range of 21 to 60, semantically, or it turns out 21 to 52 pragmatically, because this implicates that it is not the case that most of the students got all the questions right, and it's not the case that all of the students got most of the questions right. So we end up with a maximum of 52, it turns out. By contrast, some of the students got all of the questions right, gives you a range of 24 to 60 on the semantics, if we assume some is plural, that might be a pragmatic thing, or uh, pragmatically and assuming most to be an available alternative 24 to 57, all the students got some of the questions right, gives you a range of 10 to 60 semantically or 10 to 54 pragmatically, um, and so on. So I think it should say 10 to 55 pragmatically, sorry. So one way to look at it would be to say, well, out of the ranges that are left in play for all these things, which of them is the most suitable? Now, of course, that rather depends what you take to be um, criterial for the range. I don't think it's very easy to answer that question. So maybe this isn't quite the right way of looking at it, but I think just depicting it that way gives you a sense of what's, what's at stake, maybe. I think the more promising way of looking at it is, is think of it in terms of the relative likelihoods of having different, you know, what I could describe as generative processes underlying these observations, whereby a generative process, I mean, like something, something like each student has a particular chance of getting a question right, say it's probability of 0.7 if the school is good, uh, they have a chance of 0.3 if the school is bad, are these data more compatible with the 0.7 circumstance or the 0.3 circumstance? Something like that. I'm deliberately skimming over the details here because it's not, I think, not possible to present this um, at all coherently in the time available. But um, the essential idea would be we're thinking in terms of weight of evidence for different hypotheses. These different hypotheses in this case are the school is good or the school is bad. We're trying to choose the evidence that provides the greatest weight of evidence for our target hypothesis, the one that makes the likelihood ratio as big as possible in favor of that hypothesis compared to the other one. Um, so if I talk about something being argumentatively effective in the next couple of minutes, this sort of thing will be the, the kind of idea I have in mind, and we can talk more about it in, in the Q&A. The question that arises is, well, can untrained participants actually successfully be deceptive? You know, these are people who are not, you know, they're not politicians, they're not advertising executives, they have not had their moral compass professionally disabled. Uh, are they nevertheless able to mislead? And the answer is, well, yes, they are. Uh, so here's a very striking example. Given the high condition, uh, in this circumstance, people are preferring almost invariably some of the students got all of the questions right. In the low condition, they're leaping on most of the students got most of the questions wrong. And what examples like this suggest, there are many others in the data, are that um, people are actually very good at, in the first place, modulating their utterance choice according to the communicative need in terms of what information they're going to encode and how they're going to encode it. Uh, and they can do this in a way that at least tends to enhance the argumentative strength viewed in the way I discussed in the last slide in outline or in various other ways that one might um, conceive of it. Doesn't that, they don't absolutely always optimize the argumentative strength, but they do a pretty good job of providing uh, utterances that are true semantically, that are felicitous pragmatically, but are nevertheless misleading in terms of what the data actually uh, tell you about the thing of interest. Okay, so, well, that sounds a bit of a, miserable point, right? Everyone's very good at being deceptive. Let's look on the bright side. Uh, it's not just politicians, you know? We'd like to blame politicians, but maybe we get the politicians that we deserve as a species. Uh, they're just doing it more consistently than the rest of us for money, whereas the rest of us are doing it for pleasure. Um, and it's not just advertising executives, uh, and it's not just academics. I mean, you know, I feel I have to acknowledge this point, you know, academics are doing this as well. I was doing it just now. I showed you an example. You know, and this example is a particularly good illustration of the point I want to make. There are many other data points in this study. Some of them don't seem to make the point so unequivocally as this. There's a difference between the high and the low condition, and it's in favor of argumentative um, agenda. You'd have to sort of take it on trust that this is a somewhat typical um, scenario that I'm presenting here. 
Uh, the idea that academics might be selective, apart from the fact that I've just acknowledged it, is nicely taken up by an XKCD cartoon this very week. Science power move, when one of your data points is really cool, devote a whole figure to it. So, I should say this was more than one data point I just depicted. This was like, you know, several percent of the data. But I'm sensitive to the criticism. Okay, so if this is going on, how can we avoid, practically speaking, as here as being misled? And it turns out, if we think about that question seriously, that too is also very difficult, uh, maybe unsurprisingly. I think it's difficult for slightly surprising reason uh, on close inspection, and that's that uh, actually speakers are not as consistently manipulative uh, as would be helpful for us, or they're not as good at it as, as we might hope in some perverse sense. So, I mean, crudely, we could think of speakers as, you know, behaving in certain different ways. We can think of a one, a one end of the scale as sort of purely um, semantically honest and helpful and representative speaker, somebody who, if you like, is constantly drawing balls out of the urn of true statements randomly, They're selecting candidate utterances from some pos population of possible utterances and uttering them if they are semantically true. Um, and if, if speakers are doing that, then we're entitled to interpret their productions as though they're just answers to yes, no questions. Is it the case that P, I say P. Um, and that would make life very easy for us because then the things that people said would be at least you know, random samples that were somewhat representative of reality. Um, on the negative side, this is obviously ridiculous. This is clearly not what people are doing for all sorts of reasons. Um, but you know, it would be it would make life easier. We might think, well, you could add pragmatics into that and say, well, speakers select candidate utterances at random and they utter them if they're semantically true and do not give rise to false implicatures. That might be a little bit better. Uh, at the other end of the scale, we could think, well, maybe what speakers are doing is selecting among the utterances that are semantically and pragmatically true, the utterances that are most argumentatively effective for their purpose. So they're trying to say the most effective thing towards some kind of goal proposition that they would like the hearer to believe. Now, we can see how those different attitudes to what a speaker is likely doing um, would play out from an interpretive point of view. Suppose in this situation, a speaker says, Julian got some of the questions right. Um, and they might do, this is a perfectly semantically and pragmatically appropriate thing to say in this scenario. Now, if you just take that to be a random semantically true statement, the answer to the answer as essentially yes to the question, did Julian get some of the questions right? Then all things being equal, the hero will subject, uh, increase the subjective probability they assign to the proposition, the school is good. Because this is just, you know, unequivocally positive news. It's relatively weak positive news, but it is positive news. If on the other hand, it's taken as a random pragmatically true statement, that is to say, this is understood to mean Julian got some, but not all of the questions right, uh, then the hearer might increase or decrease their subjective probability of school is good, depending whether they think that Julian got some of the questions right is more or less important argumentatively than Julian got not all of the questions right. Okay, fine. But what if they're this, you know, this very critical, paranoid speaker who's worried that they're being misled all the time, manipulated. Well, you know, if this is taken to be the best available argument in favor of the proposition school is good, the hearer should sharply, sharply reduce the subjective probability they attach to the, the idea that the school is good. It's very, very unlikely that this is a good school if that's the strongest thing you could say about it, that Julian got some of the questions right. You know, now it's rather suggesting that nobody else got any questions right, not only that Julian got all the, not all of them right. Um, and that feels like too strong a conclusion to draw. So the question is, how do we deal with you know, suboptimal argumentation? How do we deal with the fact that actually speakers are not optimally argumentative, even when they're clearly not being completely objective? This reminds me slightly of you know, the challenge we have with relevance always, the idea that you know, people would like to say things that are optimally relevant, but frequently don't manage to. How do we then interpret their productions? I was kicking around some examples in the context of a paper I wrote with Michal Franca recently um, on the subject of the UK university's press releases about their previous um, research excellence framework results, um, which was partly because I kind of identified this as a rich domain of rather misleading, although factually correct descriptions. 
And you might think this is a very dangerous thing to do. Why am I provoking the sector that employs me by telling the world that they're dishonest and misleading? Isn't this just asking the universities to you know, gang up on me and put out a press release in which they found that I'm ugly and my talks are boring? It hasn't happened yet, but it will, I expect. The, the essence of the paper is, um, what they say is misleading, really quite misleading, um, but often rather suboptimally misleading, given what we take to be their argumentative agenda. How can we tell it's misleading? Well, you've got on the one hand these very, uh, very widespread use of, for example, non-standard metrics to justify encouraging headline claims. Universities say of themselves things like, we're top 20 in the United Kingdom for research intensity, without making it at all clear this is one of several measures and not the preferred one. And on the preferred one, they're a lot lower down the stack. Um, but on the other hand, you've also got relatively weak evidence uh, that is being focalized by institutions who could say much stronger things about themselves. You know, University of Sussex Research is world leading major review finds. And this is purely existential as a claim. They're saying something that 140 out of the 144 institutions in this, um, in this ref could say of their work. And yet they're in the top quartile. They could do a lot better from an argumentative perspective. Um, and you've also got a lot of people saying very confusing things that are quite difficult to uh, even evaluate for their um, argumentative strength. You know, more than 25% of the Durham University subjects entered for REF 2014 were in the top five subjects nationally for grade point average. And that doesn't make any sense in the first place, but if you, if you, you know, interpret it in such a way that it makes sense, it's very difficult to tell whether that's supposed to be an argument for they're their better than average or they're average or they're just below average or what. I mean, how many, how many of the subjects ought to be in the top five if this is an average institution, given the subjects they're submitting? There's very little context that enables you to interpret that. Essentially, you know, if you're trying to interpret it accurately, the, the headline would be, you know, you want to be somewhat paranoid, but not completely paranoid. If you're, if you're gullible, if you take all these things at face value, you're going to conclude there are about 25 institutions in the top 10 alone. If you're maximally paranoid, you're going to conclude they're all rubbish, with very few exceptions. Possibly the one exception being, I think it was, um, uh, I forgot which one of the London universities it was, which actually explained which measures they were using and how they ranked on the other measures. One institution among the 40 I looked at that did that. So, you know, returning to the Political example to try and wrap up. You know, when somebody says some mortgages are going up by an average of five hundred pounds per month, how should you orient towards that information? You know, where's this number come from? Well, the numbers come from a study which says that the increase was four hundred and ninety-eight pounds a month. I mean, we'll call that five hundred, okay? And um, that's based on an average size mortgage, two hundred and seventeen thousand pounds, on two-year fixed rate, seventy-five percent loan to value, which was remortgaged two years after. August 2020, having previously been mortgaged then. And you know, to cut through the, the details of this somewhat, you know, this is not a ridiculous claim. This is a fairly typical thing in terms of the size of the mortgage. It's a fairly atypical thing in terms of the timing. You know, you'd be very unfortunate to have to remortgage August 2022, having previously taken a two-year fix in August 2020. There can't be many people uh, for whom that applies. So this is a defensible statement. It's obviously not the strongest statement you can make because there are plenty of people with mortgages twice that size of whom you could say, you know, some mortgages are going up by an average of a thousand pounds a month. But they've elected not to do that. They think they want to make something that's slightly more defensible than that. But on the other hand, it's obviously not a typical true statement, whatever that means on the subject of mortgage rate increases. It's a very selectively chosen one. Uh, taking advantage of a confluence of factors that are very unlikely to apply to the average mortgage holder. Is this therefore a misleading statement? Well, you know, it's very weak evidence for a suspicious hearer. It's quite good evidence for a gullible hearer, assuming the objective is to draw the conclusion the government screwed up. Um, fact checkers are equivocal, unhelpfully equivocal. Full fact says uh, that this lacks important context. But in truth, you could say lacks important context about almost anything. You know, blessed are the peacemakers, lacks important context. Um, so you know, this is one of those areas where it looks as though you would really want to understand argumentativity and to understand what is and is not considered to be legitimate 
in order to establish whether this is a misleading statement or a perfectly defensible one. I wanted to say something just at the sort of tail end of this more generally about the nature of political claims from this through this lens, not on quantitative ones so much. But it does strike me that a particular dialectic arises, particularly in the context of what you know, we could call the culture war issues, which has um, points in common with this. And I'm thinking particularly of policies that are directed towards uh, relatively small groups, or to the interests of relatively, or concerns of relatively small groups of people per se. Um, where you can think of a dialectic typically emerging in which the proposers of a policy want to use this as kind of emblematic of the sort of thing they care about. You know, let's say we're talking about these issues, not because we think they're the most important issues out there, but because this gives you a sense of, you know, who we are and what we stand for and the other things that we would do. Um, and those policies are very often attacked by their opponents as on the basis of, you know, the, our opponents think this is the most important thing that's going on in the world today. They don't want to talk about the economy, they want to talk about you know, access to bathrooms for transgender people in North Carolina. Now, if you think of that dialectic, it seems like it's the same kind of thing again. It's as though, from the first point of view, um, the people proposing the policy want to invite an inference about typicality or representativity. They want to look like the people who are drawing this statement kind of at random from the urn of possible policies that they could announce. Um, and they want it to be regarded as a representative and typical example of what they would do or what they believe in. And the others are being the, the skeptical, the paranoid hearer and saying, well, like, you know, they're, they're drawing something like an exhaustivity inference. They're saying, this, we assume this is the most important thing you have to say. Um, and of course, neither of these interpretations is really warranted. Uh, you know, it's clear that somebody is taking, some, taking a policy to be emblematic or representative or typical, they don't mean this to be the most important thing they have to say or the thing that they want to, you know, draw whole attention to. But on the other hand, if this is the thing they've selected to talk about, clearly it's not truly drawn randomly from the population of possible things that could have been said. It is um, being artfully chosen and deployed with a particular agenda in mind. So again, I think, um, in order to understand where we need to arrive at in the interpretation between these two sort of polar possibilities, we would really need, we need we need a much clearer sense of how argumentativity enters into the picture. And I hope this is something that we're you know trying to edge forward on through these little toy experiments, although it may seem like a long way away from this. And I think it is somewhere where we can really make useful conceptual progress as a field uh, in the near future, and maybe an idea uh, whose time has come, and which might have some impacts beyond the usual run of things that we do. So I'm going to stop talking. I thank you very much for your attention. I'd be really interested to hear what you have to say. Well, thank you, Chris. Thank you. Mission accomplished, I would say. And uh, for questions, um, please use the chat. So put a cue in the chat and then we can determine the order. While we're waiting, one clarification question in the study you presented with um, Fausto and Michael, um, you had without lying in the prompt, did you also have a condition where you didn't use that phrase? So I'm wondering what that's doing. That's very interesting. Um, no, we didn't um, have that condition to the best of my recollection. We haven't tried to, haven't tried to, we've only been interested in trying to prevent people from um, from just saying the the most favorable thing, mm. heedless of the facts, and I think people would spontaneously tend to make truthful statements because it's sort of implied that you know, well, why, why would we even bother telling you what actually happened if we didn't care whether you made a true statement or not? Um, but I think, uh, yeah, no, it'd be, it'd be interesting to know if you if you did more or less explicitly um, loosen that stipulation, whether people really did start to. Um, go beyond the realms of what is certainly some pragmatically acceptable, maybe semantically acceptable too. Yeah, but I also wonder like what that does, right? If you put it on the table that you could be lying, which is something that we don't like typically do in these kinds of studies. So yeah, I wonder what, what that's doing to the participants' mental model of the task. 
Mm. No, it's a fair point. I mean, I think it's it's difficult to get out of the question of lying completely because we are asking people to be deceptive, essentially. So in that sense, mm. it's really very atypical of the kinds of the normal mm. run of things where we assume people are going to be cooperative and we often make fairly, um, we well, invite participants to make fairly unlikely assumptions on the face of it about the knowledge states of speakers, mm. assuming they're knowledgeable, even though they seem to be saying something quite unhelpful sometimes. Mm. Um, so yes, I would need to I would need to go away and think about that, but I think it's a very it's a very valid point, and I think the question of how you it, it obviously gets also into questions about what actually constitutes a lie. Is it is it a lie if I implicate some falsehood, um, or am I okay to do that? And that obviously becomes an issue in a lot of these cases where you know if I want to make the school sound good, um, or whether I want to make the school sound bad, I will just say they got some of them right every time. I could have said they they got all of them right. And that'll make them sound you know, a good deal worse, but then I might you know, regard myself as being deceptive, depending on my taste as to what constitutes a lie. So yeah, it's a really good question. I don't have a fully satisfactory answer to it, clearly. Thank you. And we have three questions in the chat by now. Four, but let's go with Napoleon. Hi, Chris. Thank you. Hey, no. that, that was really, really interesting. Um, for lots of reasons. It does remind me a little bit of um, a series of papers that Steven Pinker co-authored with colleagues um, about strategic speakers. So in, in their view, speaking strategically um, evol involved some kind of calculation um, regarding how I would, you know, uh, uh, communicate a certain intention um, in a way that it will be understood by my listener. Uh, but using a form of words that would allow me to uh, backtrack eventually and you know plausibly deny that this is what I that this is what I said. Um, with you know that plausibly deny it wasn't you know defined what is a plausible or what's a more plausible thing to deny. And it it felt that something like that is going on. Uh, I mean, a small part of what you were talking about seemed to be related to that. Um, I was looking at this example you had about the, the mortgages, where there came a clarification, you know, after Keir Starmer was po possibly put to the spot, there came a clarification. Could you share with us the... Yeah, um, sorry, yeah, let me put that up again. Exact, Hang on. Uh, the clarification was a two-year fixed uh, for the average, um, you know, it's, it's 498 pounds, but for a two-year fix that was taken out on the average mortgage in the country yes so i mean yes yeah, so these were the these are the facts underpinning um yes so, yeah yeah but here's something interesting um you said okay only only a small number of mortgages would um have been taken out in august 2020 but we've got two pieces of two things going on here i think i mean it's a very small example but maybe there's something in it first as those of us who live in the uk and have looked into mortgages will know fixed rate mortgages come into only a few kind of fixed durations. So basically in the UK, you get a fixed rate mortgage for two years or for five years. And then there's very, very few who are for 10 years only yep. recently. So it's not a, and now why did they choose the two year fixed rate compared to the five year fixed rate? Because if, if they had compared it to a five year fixed rate, actually the amount that the mortgage would have gone up would have been much much higher than that because in 2017 mortgages would have been much less expensive than in august 2020 but here i think they're selecting to compare it to the two-year fix rather than the five-year fix because they want to be reasonable they don't want this figure to come out as like it's going to be 800 pounds more expensive people to query and say you know wow how come is it 800 and then to reveal that it's a five-year fix and then people would tell them, well, you were unreasonable, that's too much. So there is a there is a sense of strategic selection of what the um uh the comparison is, um, such that they don't always choose the one that makes it more favorable for the argument they're making. They, they're tempering it with, you know, also what's the most reasonable, powerful. Um I couldn't, sorry, yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, I think you're absolutely right. It is, it is kind of, I mean, to be, it's a cynical approach to say, well, it's what, it's what you feel you can get away with. And it may be that, that you know, in this realm of kind of fact checking, it's as though you know, if you if you want to be, you know, if you don't want to be completely bullshitting with the facts, you want to make sure you have something that you can, that will pass muster if somebody criticizes it this way. Um, and you're right. I mean, they could certainly, they could very easily choose a non-average size mortgage. I'm not sure whether switching to a five-year fix would, would actually increase the would increase the difference. It's a little bit, um, it's a little bit complicated because it depends what the how this relates to the underlying rate, which itself hasn't changed as much. Um, so it's helpful that they should choose a fixed rather than a variable because that does slightly accentuate it. But I'm not sure how much of a difference it makes whether it's two or five. Um, so, um, and obviously it's timely to talk about a two year fixed because you you're at a point where somebody who had two feet two year fixes now remortgaging and possibly going into another two-year fixed um so those could be so last one and also two years you're still within into august 22 you're still within the government elected at the same elections we haven't had elections since then we've had many prime ministers but it's still the responsibility of the government so there's an additional reason for choosing the two-year fix there that's true yes although of course in the context of you know the conservative having conservatives having been in power since 2010 you could pick a longer date and still blame the, the government broadly construed. So I think that may be not so such a compelling reason, but I think there are, you know, you're right about the, the immediacy. If you wanted to send a message like this has happened very suddenly, you know, because these decisions things have suddenly become um bad, then you would you could you could pick on this. And um indeed critics did point out that, you know, a lot of although, although the policies that trusts were introduced and then walked back did make these numbers a lot higher, they were already considerably higher prior to that and would have been anywhere. And the difference that she made was maybe of the order of, you know, 100 to 150, 200 pounds a month in this example. So, so yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot going on. And it is that does seem to be that point of, you know, there is an <laughs> impulse of some kind to choose a true and honest and defensible statement. And that is colliding with an impulse to make this sound like a lot. It's not as though, you know, it is not a one-shot salesman pitch. Um, and politics usually isn't a you know, one-shot salesman pitch. This is something, you know, you'd want to maintain a reputation for being more or less honest and accurate and objective, um, whilst also saying things that advance your argumentative agenda. So maybe that's that's what's going on. But I think you're absolutely right. There's a, there's a lot of subtle trade-offs um, being made in choosing something like this. I think we should move on to uh, some other yeah. questions. Yeah. I mean, Natalia was next. Yeah. Hi. Thanks a lot for this uh, super interesting talk. Uh, also very useful. <laughs> now I'll be watching out for these expressions in politician speech. And uh, so my question was is probably obvious uh, and uh, named the elephant, elephant in the room. <laughs> So uh, if yes, so forgive me. Uh, so, but I'm really, really interested in um, whether um, uh, there is any empirical evidence uh, about uh, the inferences that is addressees typically make and how this correlates with their epistemic vigilance and possibly their priors. Uh, so for example, uh, yeah, what would their posteriors be using this Bayesian reasoning, for example? Uh, or rational speech theory, or whatever, any kind of model, um, yeah, concerning whether the school is good or bad, or the government is good or bad, and so on. Are there any sort of, psycholinguistic, yeah. Is there any psycholinguistic or maybe new? That's, that's, that's a really good question. I mean, beyond the, beyond the question of whether people are you know likely to take something as you know that involves a full simplicature as a lie, on which there's this the, there is some work, um, like um, Weissman and Tokarafi, um. And I suppose the I think there's plenty of the, there's relevant work um, that one could draw upon on the you know the question of whether people are more inclined to ex, uh, exercise. I think there's at least anecdotal evidence. I'm not sure how solid it is that people are more inclined to uh, exercise charity toward um, someone they agree with or a point of view they agree with. And I think this is at the back of the um, the independent example um, that you know you do get a sense that the um, the, the, the the journalist wants to write an article saying, hey, look at this idiot who I disagree with across the board um, politically uh, and who's now said this really stupid thing. 
and you know, as a consequence of that, have, have overreached themselves because they've failed to encompass the possibility that somebody they disagree with politically may not have been saying a particularly stupid thing on this particular occasion, even though there is an, you know, they're trying for an interpretation that makes it look like that. Um, so yeah, I think that that also would be, I don't think there's anything, I don't think it's been studied directly, but I think that would be um, very much something that would very much like to do um, after having gotten a little bit more of a handle on what's going on in the in, in the effects on sort of an under neutral um, condition of one, whether it is one shot with no prior expectation. Yeah, thanks, would be really interesting. Yeah, I think so. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, next question by Asya. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, I, you've shown as a slide where you've argued that people, speakers are not optimal, optimally, um, optimal in their misleading strategies, right? They, they yeah. choose utterances that might be suboptimal. And I'm trying to, to think it through about real politicians' examples and whether this strategy actually is, is a rational one, being suboptimally misleading because um, they are speaking not to an uh, object to an audience that is neutral. They're speaking to a highly polarized society. And at least half of that society will take anything as an argument as long as it, it at least somewhat reminds me of what they want to hear. So they are saving cognitive effort by, yeah, they choose something approximately what the people want to hear and uh, delivering the news that, that people welcome. And sure, there is a feedback loop that encourages this behavior. Uh, and and uh, so, yeah, wanted to hear uh, what are your ideas on that. Mm. Well, I think, I mean, it, it goes to, it goes to the point that Nap was making. Um, but I suppose that, that question of, you know, to what extent do we want to try and win the argument now as opposed to, maintain um a perception of being you know a reliable source or something of that nature so i think that's, that's sort of one element of it i mean the question i suppose is generally you know if i say that people are suboptimally argumentative what is to stop somebody else saying no no they're not sub suboptimally argumentative you've merely misidentified what their argumentative goal was on this particular occasion so Again, if I say, well, you know, why is why is Keir Starmer not saying some mortgages have gone up by a thousand pounds a month on average? Um, seems to be, well, that's because that would involve having to specify that you meant a particular category of mortgages from a particular category of people, and you don't want to, you know, open up that particular rabbit hole. You know, you might say, you know, as a politician, he doesn't want to think, he doesn't want to give the impression that he cares about people whose mortgages are twice the size of the national average. He wants to you know, look as though he cares about people whose mortgages are the size of the national average mm. mortgage rather than mm. rich people, you know. Um, so in those cases, I think you could definitely say um, the argumentative aim is maybe more subtle um, than, I'm, than I would be pretending it was if I said, well, that's why is that suboptimal? Um, I think in other cases, you could definitely make the case that it really is suboptimal, but it's suboptimal assuming perhaps more knowledge on the part of the the hearer than they possess, which also relates to, I think, Natalia's point about the priors. Um, so in the case of, you know, if I say that this uh, example from the University of Sussex saying, you know, we have world, basically, we have some world-class research here, is very weak argumentatively. I mean, I know it's weak argumentatively because I've looked at the table and seen that, that according to this metric, there's world-class research happening almost everywhere, if in some places, you know, a very small amount of it still it exists. Um, if I hadn't looked at that table, I might think, well, okay, maybe, you know, maybe world class is something they only say about some of the institutions in this study. So maybe it actually does have you know, good evidential value. Um, in much the same way that, you know, when they talk about top 20 by research intensity, I forget which institution it was, um, they don't tell you and they don't give you any reason to suspect in their press release that there is any other measure than research intensity. You know, as far as uh, as far as I concerned, that is, you know, that is holy writ that we shall be judged by research intensity. Um, and only if you know that that is not the case, you realize that this is actually not a very good argument. Um, so it could be that, you know, we've got things that are suboptimal from the point of view of the omniscient observer. 
but are really not suboptimal from the point of view of the actual addressee. Um, and that's, I suppose, also a slightly um, <laughs> a slightly depressing picture of the argumentative reality. If I say, well, it's not the it's not the student, it's not the universities are being misleading. It's just they have no respect for their audience. Um, so that could be going on as well. Um, and yeah, I think in in, in general terms, I, I, I think I've slightly wandered from the point of your question, but um, in general terms, those, those are definitely factors that could be you know entering into the question of is this is this optimal or not. Thank you. And we have one more question from Bob. All right. So thanks, uh, Chris. Hi, Bob. Uh, my you. question was actually very similar to uh, Natalia's, namely whether these argumentative strategies actually work? Um, and if so, assuming they work because people do them a lot, why do they work? So is it the case that hearers are pragmatically lazier than speakers? And if that's the case, why? Hmm, that's a really good question. I think, um, I mean, I think people would mostly take it that, you know, if, if we're cooperative, um, and that at least you know at least some of the time we're cooperative, and the things that uh, the things that we say to each other are um, invite typicality inferences that enrich them. I suppose the example I have in mind is the likes of you know the the Gricean example about you know I'm out of petrol. There's a garage around the corner. By which I mean you know there's a garage that sells petrol and it's open as far as I know. Um, we think well that's you know the, the, we're invited to infer that the, the stereotypical features of the situation apply in such a case um and in these these cases are in some sense sort of atypical because you're talking about complex data sets and presenting information about them that might be really quite concocted that might be really atypical that might be you know it's isn't this a, it's a remarkable fact given this data that we can say this about it but nevertheless we can say it about it um and those cases just invite there to be you know considerable disparity between the situation that you would naturally project um underlying these data and the one that is really in place um so i suppose you know that question of you know would you want to be would it be adaptive for us to be that that paranoid speaker and I suppose I'm getting in as a, or rather as a hero. As a hero, I think I'm getting more paranoid myself. You know, I'm now taking things that do have evidentiary value, interpreting them with you know excessive caution. Um, for that reason, you know, it's like when you if you read a paper and think yes, but does this you know what's the likelihood this is replicable given given the publishing conditions of our field, um, which is you know probably slightly more cynical than you really need to be when reading um reading the scientific literature maybe it's not but you know um and in that in that same spirit you might think well if i'm adaptive to interactions that are cooperative i do want to have certain kinds of inference available to me and, and still want to routinize those and it's really then a matter of knowing when to switch it off and how to switch it off or turn it down something of that nature. So I suspect it, it works because we're still free riding on a, on a sort of basis of an expectation of cooperativity, which does still apply in a lot of cases. And maybe when I say that politicians might not want to make optimal argumentative interventions because they also want to preserve their reputation for objectivity, that's sort of what I mean, you know, it's as though I'm not going to try and convince you of the, you know, egregious awfulness of my opponent right now, I'm going to make an objective statement about them now. And then when I try and convince, convince you of their awfulness at a later date, I will have more credibility to you as a result of that long game, in essence. Um, so maybe I, that would be my, my conjecture. So thank you for the discussion. And thanks again to Chris um, for your talk. Well, thank uh, you for the invitation, I should say. We have, of course. Um, we have nailed down our next two speakers. So in January, we will have Napoleon Katzos and in February, Fernanda Ferreira. So uh, stay tuned and uh, happy holidays, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, Chris. Oh, Chris already disappeared.
Ah, he's gone. Hmm. Bye bye. Can you stop the recording? Yes, let me do that. I think sometimes.